Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Mark Erkin, and uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, this morning's Journal Club. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled to introduce our two presenters this morning. Um, as has been our, um, our, our protocol in the past, I'd like to just call everybody's attention to the questions tab um, that is on the right-hand side of your screen. And we would very much welcome uh, participants to write in their questions, which we will try to get to um, before uh, the end of the session, which is a hard stop at 9 o'clock um, so that everybody can get on with their day. Um, so please just go ahead and um, enter questions, um, and we will do our best to um, include those before the end of the session. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nike Ospina, who is an endocrinologist at the University of Florida. Dr. Ospina has special interest in research related to diagnosis and management of um, decisions faced by patients with thyroid cancer. Her research into the value of shared decision-making in patients with newly discovered thyroid nodules is funded by a career development award from the National Cancer Institute and it is really an honor to have her present this morning, um, along with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mechanic, who will be this morning's discussant. He is professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is also medical director of the Center for Clinical Cardiovascular Health and director of metabolic support in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Bone Disease um, at Mount Sinai. He is past president of the American Association of um, clinical endocrinologist. His qualifications and accomplishments are far too long and too extensive to review here, but we are certainly honored to have him as today's discussant. So with that, um, Dr. Ospina, maybe if you could start off um, with our poll and we'll circle back to that um, at the conclusion and just see if this morning's presentation had an impact on our perceptions about this very important topic. All right, uh, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, first, let me uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and the uh, introduction. I'm really happy to uh, have the opportunity to share the, the results of the, this paper, uh, weight changes after thyroid surgery for patients with benign thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, a population-based study, and a systematic review and meta-analysis. And this was uh, published in Thyroid uh, back in 2018. Uh, I don't have any um, disclosures as they relate to this topic, although I have to say I'm more of a kind of like middle of the morning person or late afternoon person. So I'm happy I'm on the east, uh, east side uh, at the time of this presentation. So uh, as you mentioned, this is the, uh, the case uh, to kind of set up the discussion. So this was a 49 year old female uh, that is uh, scheduled to undergo total thyroidectomy after cytological confirmation of malignancy in a 2.6, 3.2 thyroid nodule uh, that had evidence of uh, extrathyroidal extension. Uh, the patient is concerned about possible weight gain that might occur after surgery. So before the surgery, you discuss uh, possible sequelae that might result from a thyroidectomy and explain that no weight gain is expected after surgical treatment. Weight gain should be expected after surgical treatment as a result of the uh, postoperative hypothyroidism. Weight gain is expected and more notable than in patients who undergo surgery for benign thyroid nodules and moderate weight gain could be expected, but it's unrelated to the surgical intervention. So have uh, most people voted? I cannot really see the results on my screen, so. 
Yes, there, just to clarify, there's roughly a um, pretty even distribution between options one, two, and four. Okay, all right. So um, my objectives today will be first to uh, review and summarize the results of our study. And I would like you to kind of break those into uh, the clinical findings. So what ex uh, weight change and BMI change we can expect after each of the procedures. And then second, review the uh, quality of the evidence that is informing those uh, clinical findings. And then most importantly, then discuss how the results of the study can be used to counsel patients who require thyroid surgery uh, in regards to the, case, to the weight expectations, which is really the question the, uh, the case uh, uh, was focusing on. Uh, I think um, we know that whenever we mention thyroid and weight, there's going to be like this uh, kind of like a, a level of attention because patients are concerned about it, clinicians are concerned about it, and researchers uh, are concerned about it. So it's a, it's a big topic, uh, thyroid and weight. Just to uh, validate that point, uh, this is a, um, a review that was looking uh, at studies uh, trying to associate uh, uh, thyroid hormones and BMI and adiposity. So on the uh, x-axis, um, you can see here the number of studies. And then on the y, either association with TSH or active hormones with adiposity and BMI. Uh, my, the main two things here are large number of studies for the different associations, and then kind of like inconclusive results um, with some showing an association and the, and the other uh, showing no association between different thyroid hormones, BMI and adiposity. Um, why, uh, at least uh, from the physiological perspective, is, this, is there this association between thyroid and weight? Uh, it's mostly because if we think about the, uh, the uh, total energy expenditure that we have, uh, which is going to be a big determinant of, of a person's weight, that is going to be uh, uh, integrated by their physical activity and the uh, resting metabolic rate. And uh, here in the resting metabolic rate is where your thyroid function uh, can uh, have the most effect. Uh, some animal studies would suggest that uh, going from hypo to hyperthyroidism can uh, lead to changes in the uh, resting metabolic rate of 30 to 50 percent. And given that uh, the total energy expenditure is a big component of weight, then a 10 to 20 percent change uh, in body weight. So definitely there's a scientific premise, at least from physiology, that there's a strong association. Moreover, uh, these are just of uh, a, a summary of clinical situations where this comes up. Uh, we know that patients with either overt hypo or hyperthyroidism, after they get treated, depending on the situation, can either gain or lose an average of five to seven kilograms um, one year after treatment. Um, on the other side, uh, if you have patients with thyroid cancer that are on suppressive therapy with levothyroxine uh, with, and low TSH, um, still 30% of these patients complain of weight gain uh, as an issue. And in the terms of hypothyroidism, we know that uh, a lot of patients on, on thyroid hormone with normal thyroid functions are not satisfied with, uh, with therapy, and weight gain or difficulty with weight loss uh, is a common complaint. In addition, then, we're kind of like living on an epidemic of obesity. Uh, whenever I see these graphs, I, I'm always uh, very concerned. This is, I'm just showing the one of 2018, but it, I'm, sure, I'm sure you have seen them chronolo chronologically. And it's very concerning because you always think that eventually we're all going to be obese. Uh, but here right now, uh, most states are having rates of obesity that is more than 30%. So as it relates to, to thyroid cancer and thyroid disease, uh, at least from the Nodio perspective, we know that more FNAs are being done in the U.S. Uh, on a yearly basis uh, by reports from early this decade, at least more than a half a million per, per year. Uh, that has obviously then kind of like fit uh, the number of uh, patients that need to undergo surgery, at least 50,000 new diagnoses of thyroid cancer per year, uh, and more than 130 thyroid surgeries, again, based on data from early in these decades. So all of that is making uh, the counseling of kind of like complications after thyroid surgery uh, more common. And usually this is going to be based on kind of like the more common things, I would say, um, talking about the hypocalcemia, vocal cord paralysis, infection, uh, bleeding, uh, and things like that. But given the background that I just told you, and given the association that um, patients, clinicians, and researchers are making between thyroid and weight, it's not uncommon um, that the question about, is this going to affect my weight, uh, comes up. And just to kind of like validate that point, if you put on Google just thyroid uh, surgery and uh, 
cancer and weight, you see that these ones are really kind of like uh, auto-populated and they have their, their little answer. So if you see here, number two is how much weight do you gain after thyroidectomy? How do you lose weight after thyroid surgery and so on? Uh, so clear, uh, clearly uh, people are asking this question and not necessarily um, do we have a, a clear answer for it. So, you know, with that uh, a background, I would like just to bring your attention to um, this book that is called um, Sapiens, A Brief History of uh, Humankind. If you haven't read it, I strongly uh, recommend it. And kind of like what I have said is that we have this question about how should we counsel patients, uh, what is going to happen to their weight uh, after thyroid surgery. And in this book, uh, one of the many things they discuss is that the uh, scientific revolution and kind of like a, the uh, significant advancement of uh, Homo sapiens as a, as, a, as a species had to do with, uh, with the scientific revolution, which was when we realized that there are things that we don't know and that there, is, uh, there are also important things that we don't know. So I think I, hopefully I have given you enough background to say that we don't know everything as it relates to thyroid and weight, and that obviously uh, it will be important to know as much as we can uh, about this, uh, this association. Uh, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to to move forward. So what I'm going to be presenting today is are going to be then the results of a, an individual study that we did trying to answer this question, and then a systematic review and meta-analysis. And it's kind of like really presenting two studies uh, today. So the individual study, we have kind of like total access to the data, so we could do a little bit more uh, analysis on it, uh, and it was to kind of get a sense of our own experience of what was happening to our patients. And then the uh, systematic review has to do with basically identifying all the other studies that have tried to answer this question. And then the meta-analysis is kind of like taking uh, the estimate of how much weight gain or weight loss uh, each of these studies reported and statistically coming up, coming up with an overall estimate. So that's going to be one thing we're going to discuss, that overall estimate from looking at all the studies that were done up to the uh, time we did this review. And then the second benefit of the systematic review is that we can look at all the studies and see what things have been done and kind of evaluate the whole quality of the evidence according to whether the studies were at high risk of bias and, and other factors that I'll try to mention through the, through the talk. So in terms of the uh, population-based study, uh, this was a retrospective study uh, using uh, data uh, of patients from the Olmsted County uh, in Minnesota. Uh, we had a group of patients that had thyroid cancer and were treated with surgery. Uh, and we had a, a group of patients with benign thyroid nodules based on FNA uh, that then either we were just following after the FNA or uh, that had had surgery for the uh, benign nodules. And these were uh, kind of like two different cohorts uh, that we had created to look at other clinical questions and then uh, also use um, for, the, uh, for the weight uh, study. So what we did obviously was uh, then review the records of the patients uh, based on uh, looking at clinical information that I'll present. Uh, we really try to focus on their weight and their thyroid function tests, either after the, um, after the surgery uh, or after the FNA for those who didn't have surgery. And we excluded uh, patients uh, that had any of the conditions or medications listed here that can basically um, lead to a weight, uh, weight change. And the main outcome was really uh, weight changes during follow-up. Uh, as I said, then we looked at baseline, either before the surgery or before an FNA, and then at kind of like up to one year, up to two years, and up to uh, three years uh, after follow-up. Uh, the weight was measured as part of their routine clinical visits, so patients were uh, wearing their home clothes and, and things like that. Uh, so it was just part of routine care. Uh, these were the uh, three groups that we had. Um, kind of uh, the thyroid cancer group where everybody had surgery and had about 181 patients. Uh, a group of patients with benign nodules that didn't have surgery, so this really served as a control group in a way. Uh, we're just following people after they had had an FNA, and that was the largest group with 226. And then we had a small group of patients that had uh, benign thyroid nodules and had uh, undergone surgery. Just to, as you can see across the three groups, um, most were kind of like middle-aged women. Uh, to describe a little bit more the thyroid cancer group, we can see here that uh, most of the patients uh, had had a total thyroidectomy, and most of them had low-risk thyroid cancer. 30% uh, had uh, treatment with uh, radioactive iodine, and all of those were prepared with, uh, uh, with uh, withdrawal of the hormone. What we did when calculating the TSH is that values that were assessed with more than 10 
we associated them with the uh, preparation for the RAI and we excluded it from this uh, calculation. Uh, and then in the benign audio group, 25% uh, had a total uh, thyroidectomy. Um, here, obviously, the goal was not suppression for most patients in terms of TSH, uh, but the average uh, through the study, through the different times, you can see it's kind of like lower end of normal. And if you look at the other two groups of benign nodules, some are the, uh, the, the average is uh, elevated, which just suggests that some of these patients actually were uh, hypothyroid, some on, some on treatments and some not necessarily uh, being adhered to it. So these uh, next two slides are going to be the, the uh, summary of the, of the weight changes and BMI changes for our study, just kind of to orient you. Here we have uh, group A is the thyroid cancer group, group B kind of like the control group after an FNA, no surgery, and then group C, benign thyroid nodules uh, with, uh, uh, with surgery. And then here in the x-axis, then we have towards the right is always going to be weight gain, and then towards the left is, left is uh, weight loss. Uh, so what I wanted to highlight here first is that, you know, most of these points, which are the estimates, are kind of like most of them are less than two kilograms. Um, and then um, the second point would be that our confidence inter intervals were rather wide. So you can see that they pass the line of uh, uh, no statistical significance. And then uh, on this, uh, on the left side, you can see then that we compare a kind of like the change of the thyroid cancer group that had surgery and then a group of patients after FNA and we saw if there was any difference in their weight changes at one year, two years and three years and you can see that none of those uh, were statistically significant. Um, and in the uh, kind of like estimate of, of the expected uh, weight gain uh, was mostly around uh, two kilograms. And then uh, when we looked at this same data but now kind of like normalized by the height of the patients, we had rather similar results uh, the magnitude, I would say most of it less than one unit of BMI, but really vast majority probably less than half a unit of BMI. A lot of the estimates kind of like crossing the line of uh, no difference, and then no statistical difference between the group with, bi uh, with uh, thyroid surgery because of thyroid cancer and a group of patients followed after they had had a, a benign uh, FNA. So uh, as I mentioned before, because we had access to the full data set, uh, we also tried to see if there were any clinical variables that were associated with a weight gain of more than 5%. And these are the ones that, uh, that we focus on, uh, but the analysis showed no association with uh, weight changes of, my, of 5%, of more than 5% with any of the variables that, that are listed here. Uh, moreover, uh, because our thyroid cancer cohort uh, was rather heterogeneous, as I tried to highlight uh, on, the, on that uh, first summary slide, uh, we did some subgroup group analysis according to type of surgery, so total versus lobectomy. Uh, we also focused just on the group that had uh, low risk thyroid cancer and had had total thyroidectomy. And we also focused uh, uh, only on those who, who never had a suppressed DSH. And at the end of the day, the results were very similar. We had a small, a small effect sizes in terms of weight changes, so less than one kilogram. And then all of them were kind of crossing the line of no significance, so they, at least uh, they were not statistically uh, significant. So that's kind of like what we found uh, when we look at the database uh, in, um, in Olmsted County, Minnesota. So uh, what we did then was uh, did the uh, systematic review of the literature where we were looking for studies uh, that would have patients that could fit any of the cohorts that I have shown you at the beginning and that they were reporting on the weight and BMI uh, before and after the surgery so that then we can pull the estimates of weight and BMI change uh, together. I'll start first uh, with the group A, which is basically uh, patients with thyroid cancer um, after surgery. And here I just want to highlight first, uh, similar to our study, which is listed at the end, uh, that most of these studies included uh, women that were kind of middle age. And then uh, for most studies, they, they report that the goal was TSA suppression. In our study, I would say that it was rather variable, but the, um, the, um, the average TSH was on the kind of like mid lower end of, uh, of normal. So I'm going to be presenting a few of these uh, of these graphs. So I just wanted to again kind of like orient you to, to the data that I'm presenting. So on the left side, you'll see each of the studies. So we can see see number here. Uh, this is the results of our study. Uh, so each of these are the studies here, and then in the middle part, you get kind of like a graphical representation of the expected weight changes that is expressed in kilograms over here. If you like the numbers, each of these boxes is related to the size of the study. 
Uh, and then you can see this line here, which has to do with the confidence interval uh, associated with that uh, the particular estimate. And then on the right lower corner, you have the statistical analysis from the meta-analysis, which is just taking all these numbers together and come up with the, uh, uh, with the summary. And then on the left side, you see this number here called the I square that has to do with inconsistency or heterogeneity, which has to do with kind of like how far or how different are the results uh, of each of these studies when, when compared together. So in this case, uh, for the group A, which were the patients that had thyroid cancer and surgery, is, this is the analysis that we have more studies. And this is including the longest follow-up reported in the study. Uh, what we found was an average of a 0.78 kilogram increase uh, that was uh, statistically significant. Then when we look at studies um, that provided data between one and two years of follow-up, uh, you see that we have a little less uh, studies. And here again, you can see on the right side that we had a statistically significant increase of about 0 0.95, 0 0.94 kilograms at uh, one to two years, kind of if we just did that subgroup. And then we did a subgroup looking at kind of longer follow-up. And here the weight change was again positive, so towards the right of the line, uh, but not statistically significant. And this result kind of uh, held true when it was normalized to the height of the patient in the BMI. So you can see at longest follow-up, uh, 0.46 uh, units of BMI change. Uh, that was statistically significant. At one to three, it was not significant here, but again, it was positive. Uh, so there was weight gain. Uh, and similarly, at three to five years, positive, but not uh, statistically significant. So really for group A or patients with thyroid cancer that are undergoing surgery, uh, what we found was that when including all the studies uh, to the longest follow-up, there was an increase of 0.78 kilograms, uh, which will be 0.46 uh, units of BMI. And this was uh, statistically significant. Uh, when we looked according or kind of like break down the studies according to follow-up time, uh, the estimates were positive in both analyses but uh, only at one to two years, uh, 0.94 kilograms was uh, statistically significant. Now, the second part are the patients with benign nodules that are undergoing follow-up. Again, I, I think of this just as a kind of like indirect uh, control group to certain extents. These are just patients that had a benign biopsy, uh, still uh, mostly um, female and middle age. And then here, obviously the goal was to have normal TSH, Although some of these patients included uh, both in our studies and in the others uh, were hypothyroid on treatment. And what we found here uh, for longest follow-up, you can see first that we have less uh, studies contributing to this estimate, was though that when we pulled them all together, there was a positive weight gain of uh, 1.5 kilograms just for patients who are following after an FNA. Um, if we kind of looked only at one to two years or at the data at one to two years, uh, the estimate was positive, again, not statistically significant. And uh, when looking at um, normalized by BMI, uh, positive uh, 0.68 uh, units at longest follow-up um, and not statistically significant, but positive uh, at one to two years. So kind of like for groups of patients that are just going, you know, that we have their data of weight after they have had an FNA, uh, we're including all studies, they were gaining weight or on average seem to be gaining weight 1.5 kilograms and 0.68 of BMI change. Uh, but when we broke them down, at least in this group, we could only do one to two years. The estimate was positive for weight gain, but it was not uh, statistically significant. And then uh, lastly is the group of patients with benign nodules that actually had surgery. Uh, so similar demographics, uh, as I have mentioned, and similar, similar issue with the, uh, with the TSH, which is going to be a confounder, uh, obviously, for the analysis. Uh, so here we had less studies and kind of we could only look at one to two years, but again, this was positive at 1.07 kilograms. Um, and then uh, when we look at the BMI, again, towards the right of the, of the, of the x-axis, meaning weight gain, uh, but with the confidence interval uh, not being narrow enough to be clinically, uh, to be statistically significant. So in, in the case of patients with benign thyroid nodules undergoing surgery, this is the, um, the analysis that, that we have kind of like less uh, studies. And even in our study, this was kind of the smaller group as well. Um, at two years, up to two years of follow-up, there was weight gain of 1.1 kilograms that was uh, statistically significant. Um, and we here were not able to do other subgroup analysis because we didn't have that many, many studies. 
So summary of the evidence, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have kind of like first the uh, clinical estimate of what to expect in terms of weight changes. So overall, uh, it appears that all groups were gaining weight. Um, the thyroid cancer and, and surgery group, the benign nodules being followed, and the benign nodules uh, after surgery. And the range of weight gain will be between 0.7 and 1.5 kilograms. And we can all agree that there are like these groups are rather uh, heterogeneous. Um, and the benign thyroid nodal group, which would be as a, as a control, was also gaining weight. And then the second kind of like value of having done the uh, systematic review was uh, to evaluate the body of evidence. So all of the studies I presented are observational. It's obviously hard to think of, a, of trying to answer this question uh, with a randomized trial. Um, all these studies had at least moderate degrees of bias because there was uh, not complete follow-up. And there were many confounders that were um, uh, that were not evaluated or adjusted for. Um, other things that I kind of mentioned through the presentation uh, was there's this inconsistency or heterogeneity of the result, which was that I square that was on the left of the graph. That was rather low for most of the study the studies. That had to do a little bit with, with the confidence interval being a little bit large for a lot of the estimates. So that's the imprecision. And I think the indirectness is mostly um, related to the fact of the heterogeneity of each of the groups. Um, and we didn't evaluate it specifically for publication bias, uh, but we did look at uh, articles that were uh, published just as abstracts and things like that. So at the end of the day, uh, that estimate of 0.7 to 1.5 kilograms is actually coming from uh, low quality evidence, which is again, as I said, in addition to having the number, another of the advantages of looking at the data in the context of, uh, of the whole body of evidence. So in conclusion, I think, um, or I hope, hopefully, um, the results uh, are, are convincing that kind of low quality evidence suggests that patients receiving care for thyroid cancer or thyroid nodules gain weight during follow up. And this is despite having different indications for surgery and different TSH goals, just to mention uh, a few of possible confounders there. All in all, though, uh, the weight uh, um, appears to be minor uh, 0.7 to 1.5 kilograms if you just look at the three, across the three groups. Um, I think uh, given the, all the differences and the fact that we had a kind of like a control group that is just being followed after FNA, it's very likely that this weight gain is uh, multifactorial and not necessarily associated with thyroid surgery. I just listed here a few variables that probably have a lot of impact on weight changes as uh, each year follow-up uh, was happening, uh, different things related to calorie intake, physical activity, the overall health status of the, of the participants, uh, just to name a few. So when faced with a patient as the one that, uh, that was presented on the case, I usually provide usual counseling related to healthy lifestyles to maintain normal weight um, when patients are undergoing surgery. Uh, going back to that slide uh, of uh, the obesity epidemic, um, I also discussed that uh, there is definitely an association with the thyroid and weight and make emphasis on uh, the resting metabolic rate, uh, as well as then um, saying that just a minor uh, weight gain uh, would be expected, and then that this could be uh, probably not the best time to, depending on the clinical situation, uh, kind of like start eating more, more calories or decrease your physical activity once you're recovering. And then uh, for patients that are hypothyroid, I also, as I said, I talk about the kind of like your metabolism and then try to use that um, to discuss the importance of being adherence to, adherent to, um, to thyroid uh, hormone treatment for patients that are hypothyroid. So uh, thank you very much for the attention. I have uh, I moved to Gainesville just a, a few years ago, uh, but I'm a huge uh, sports fan. Uh, so I become kind of like number one fan of, of the Gators. And I'm hoping that uh, at some point in the near future, all this uh, sports competition can safely restart. Uh, but in the meantime, um, yeah, thank you again for kind of like hosting uh, this, these discussions online so that at least so some things feel uh, normal. Thank you. Okay, well, I guess I'll start. Um, Stella, Dr. Erkin, can you hear me okay? Yep. 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 Okay. All good. All good, Jeff. Terrific, thanks. Um, Dr. Singh Spina, that was an excellent talk, and pardon me for not having my video, but I really enjoyed it. It's a very important talk, and uh, what I'd like to do is put this talk in perspective to provide some context of why it's such an important study for the healthcare professional, for those of us who are actually seeing patients. We can go to the next slide, please, and the next one. 
So let me just summarize the study. There is a premise that thyroid surgery is associated with weight gain. That's the, going to be the concern that our patients are going to have. And to address this, uh, this particular study uh, was a population-based retrospective study and was also coupled with a systematic review to enhance the discussion of the literature. It was a large study, 435 patients. And uh, as we go through some of the uh, other literature uh, uh, that the systematic review was based on and some of the supporting information, this was a much larger study. And that was actually one of the points uh, that was made by the authors that there re really needed to be a better methodology. And you can see the breakdown of the groups. And uh, overall, the findings were that this was a negative study. Essentially, patients gain weight uh, with thyroid nodules or with thyroid cancer, uh, but this was not significantly affected by having the surgery. And that's excluding the small group of patients with benign nodules with surgery, which really was too small uh, to really contribute to an overall aggregated conclusion. Next slide, please. So what's the validity and the context of this research question? Why on earth would we even be interested in, in asking this question? Well, there are three points. First, abnormal adiposity. And uh, take note that we're using this terminology instead of the word obesity. Uh, obesity is, is really narrowly defined in terms of body mass index. It's confounded by ethnicity, by musculature, by edema, uh, by other chronic diseases, and it's really failed us in terms of a healthcare system in making important clinical decisions. Abnormal adiposity has to do not only with the amount of body fat, but also the distribution and the abnormal function of adipocytes. And abnormal adiposity is a key metabolic driver of what we now term cardiometabolic-based chronic disease. And uh, this is cardiovascular disease with metabolic drivers like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, lipids, inflammation, et cetera. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of mortality worldwide. So within this context, you can now see how important the question is. And patients often complain of weight gain after thyroid surgery. Uh, as Dr. Singh Spina pointed out, we're doing more and more uh, thyroid surgery. We have more technology with ultrasounds. We're picking up these thyroid nodules more and more. So there, there's really more of a captive audience, and they're very concerned about weight gain uh, after surgery. Maybe they've heard about it from friends, uh, reading it on the Internet, seeing it in media, and this is something that really needs to be discussed. And for the purpose of, of my discussion here, I'm not going to discuss surgery for hyperthyroidism. So we need higher quality uh, studies to close these research and knowledge gaps. A research gap is an unanswered question. A knowledge gap is actually where the answer is there, but not everybody has exposure to that answer. Some people know the answer, other people don't know the answer, and we really need to close these gaps on the effects of thyroid surgery on abnormal adiposity. Next slide. So here's just a brief slide from a double paper that we put out in Journal of American College of Cardiology, looking at cardiometabolic-based chronic disease. On the top row, ABCD, which was a previous publication, and endocrine practices adiposity-based chronic disease. Uh, the second row is dysglycemia-based chronic disease, which spans insulin resistance, the type 2 diabetes, the cardiovascular complications. And then the bottom row is cardiometabolic-based chronic disease. But you can see in the red, insulin resistance figures centrally. And as we're trying to find that missing link of why we're getting into trouble with weight gain after thyroid surgery, or in general, independent of thyroid surgery, it's going to probably come down to this uh, essential plague that we have in our, our culture of insulin resistance. Next slide. So what are the potential drivers of weight gain with thyroid surgery? Well, as was pointed out by Dr. Singh Spina, with euthyroidism, it's probably unlikely to changes in thyroid glandular function or thyroid hormone economy. Uh, with age, 
Uh, yeah, but you know what? This is only a three-year study, and uh, although there may be some mild changes, I think we should move on to see if there are other drivers that are, act that are actionable. So what could they be? What, what would those drivers look like? They may be related to interactions of adiposity with thyroid function and autoimmunity, and they may be related to the effects of thyroid hormone on adipocyte physiology and appetite or behavior, brain function. Next slide. So now let's just go through the literature. These are the papers that Dr. Singospina incorporated in her systematic review, but they were presented in aggregated form. Let me sort of tease them out. And the flavor you're going to be left with at the end is really where we're nowhere, where the weight of evidence isn't going to really lean one direction or another, but let's see. So starting in 2011, uh, in the first study, more weight gain one year after thyroidectomy compared with hypothyroidism or iatrogenic hyperthyroidism, most pronounced in menopausal women. So is there some unknown factor associated with surgery, with thyroid surgery? But same year, same journal, same issue, no difference after thyroidectomy, despite subjective complaint. The patient saying, Doc, I'm, I'm what are you going to do about it? So now we move on to the next year, 2012, weight gain three to five years after thyroidectomy. This is in patients with thyroid cancer, and that weight gain even with a suppressed TSH. A little counterintuitive, unless you believe that the extra thyroid hormone is appetite, and that's the driver. And then we move forward to 2016, no difference after thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer, with or without a low TSH. So again, uh, conflicting data. Next slide. Now we're moving up to just last year. Now we look at the metabolic rate and the resting uh, energy expenditure that we heard about. So it's not going to be non-exercise activity thermogenesis, the thermic effect of food, the physical activity, but the effects of thyroid on the resting metabolic rate. And it turned out it did not correlate with weight after thyroidectomy. Another paper, even the extent of thyroid surgery. So you saw that there was a little bit of a mixed bag in some of the groups. Some of the patients, 83% had total thyroidectomy in the cancer group, a lesser number in the benign group. But it turned out that the extent of thyroid surgery did not correlate with post-op weight gain or obesity. And then finally, a paper showing no correlation of thyroid dysfunction and BMI. And this is with medical or surgical treatment of hyper or hypothyroidism, uh, where there was an association with weight change. Next slide. So let me just uh, point out a, a few things. Uh, one issue is Elizabeth Pierce uh, published a very nice review in Current Opinions and uh, Endocrinology, Diabetes, Obesity, uh, postulating that thyroid hormone was acting through leptin. We actually published a, an extensive paper looking at leptin, the cardiovascular system, global obesity problem, and although a very, very busy slide, that was done intentionally to illustrate the complex nature of what's going on in the hypothalamus and the brain in terms of behavior and the appetite center. But if you look at those red stars, basically what's happening is leptin, uh, as part of a negative feedback loop, right, as you have more fat, uh, you make more leptin, it then suppresses appetite to lose the fat, and maybe that's happening in a, in a teleologic way through activation of the thyroid axis and also increasing the conversion of T4 to T3 and increasing that resting energy expenditure. And maybe somehow this gets subverted uh, with thyroid surgery. Next slide. So let's look at something else. Maybe it's actually reverse causality. Maybe there's a causal role for obesity and benign nodular thyroid disease or thyroid cancer, but really no. The evidence doesn't uh, bear that out. This is a Mendelian randomization study looking at SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, looking for causal relationships with a modifiable trait. 
and uh, whether there's beta error, not enough samples, but really the, the study was confounded and they're really, they were unable to tease out an effect of obesity on uh, the thyroid disease. Next slide. So let's conclude uh, this discussion. We find that there's unknown complex drivers of weight gain after thyroid surgery. Uh, we really don't have much of an answer. The best studies, the one that Dr. Singh Ospina uh, did and presented to you, uh, showed that thyroid surgery is probably not the culprit per se, and that we can reassure and advise patients that the surgery itself, per se, has not been demonstrated to cause significant weight gain. However, weight gain is observed over time in all the patients with thyroid nodular disease, including thyroid cancer. So this is something that's pervasive. This is something that's part of our environment, genetics, our lifestyle, and really we need to be approaching lifestyle and healthy living as part of our encounters with all patients, particularly those high risk. Next slide. What I'm going to do is wrap up with a big picture here. And the big picture is really a strategy that all of us should be doing, that our strategy should be about disease prevention and health promotion, it should be early and sustainable, as early as possible, and in a way in which it can be sustained. The tactics, so how do you do this? It's one thing to say we should be doing it, but how do you do it? So there's three scales of structure, a micro scale, which are changing the individual routines of the individual patients. A meso scale, intermediate, and that's actually building structure like lifestyle medicine centers or incorporating it in your thyroid center. So, so Dr. Erkin, you have a thyroid center and this would be important to incorporate lifestyle medicine within that thyroid center. And then lastly, a macro structure, which is uh, involving government and policies uh, industry, various protocols. So the third bullet point, patients being evaluated for thyroid surgery represent an important opportunity to discuss lifestyle change. And that would be the message that I would leave you with. Next slide. So with that, I think what we're going to do is uh, repeat that question you heard at the beginning, uh, and let's see if anything has uh, changed. Uh, this is a 49-year-old uh, female scheduled to undergo total thyroidectomy, uh, Bethesda 6. It's a malignancy, 2.6 by 3.2 centimeter thyroid nodule, ultrasound evidence of extrathyroidal extension. Patient's very concerned about weight gain that might occur after surgery. Now, before the surgery, you're discussing the possible sequelae that might result from thyroidectomy and explain that. No weight gain is expected after, thyroid, uh, after surgical treatment. Weight gain should be expected after surgical treatment due to postoperative hypothyroidism. Weight gain is expected and more notable uh, than in patients who undergo surgery for benign nodules. And lastly, moderate weight gain could be expected, but it's unrelated to the surgical intervention. Terrific. Um, thank you, Jeff, and um, thank you, uh, Nike, for amazing uh, presentations this morning. I would have to say, in looking at the poll, um, both before and after your presentations, that this is probably um, the most significant impact on our participants um, voting on um, response to this poll. And so, from that point of view, I would say that your presentations have been um, extremely impactful. And for that, um, and with this, uh, there have been a number of questions that I would like to uh, pose to uh, both of you, and you can choose to, um, uh, and each one of you can choose to answer these in, independently, and I'll try to get through them um, so that all the participants have an opportunity to have their voices heard. 
Um, so one of the things um, related to the T3 question, um, and maybe if you could just comment on that, both whether um, in, from a research perspective or anecdotal, um, whether or not adding a T3 as part of a supplement, um, have, have you had experience in doing that for patients who have experienced weight gain and what's the impact been um, of, of that intervention? Who would you like to go first, Mark? Um, Nike? Yeah. Um, so, well, I guess um, from a research perspective, I think the, um, the data is not going to be there to support uh, T3 as an intervention at that, uh, uh, for, that, uh, for that clinical situation. But I think it's um, kind of like, a, as I have mentioned at the beginning, there are still kind of a lot of things that we don't, don't know. That same evidence uh, can be kind of like criticized about how the T3 was delivered. Um, was that the, the way that, you know, should we give three doses or two doses or things like that? So over, overall, the, the, the data right now will not support that. Uh, however, I don't think the data is, is, is conclusive or has uh, evaluated kind of like all the angles that it has to. So I would say that that's a, an open, open question there about um, how, I think what happens is that when let's say you have a patient with hypothyroidism that is still having symptoms, um, I, I wonder if we are actually replacing them, replacing them correctly just with levothyroxine uh, and whether T3 could be helpful uh, given that the symptoms are the symptoms and complaints are still there. Um, from a purely uh, researcher uh, answer, uh, there's no evidence that uh, T3 should be given. Uh, but when you look into more detail, uh, maybe more research needs to be done to actually answer that question um, kind of like without leaving any doubt. Um, anecdotally, I could say that um, in the clinic, um, if a patient is having a, those kind of issues, um, I, I have uh, used a trial of uh, T3. Um, and it's, uh, it's hard to say. I would say the responses are very variable. And again, I go back to that discussion of kind of like lifestyle changes. Probably those uh, have more impact than the um, addition of, uh, of T3 or not. Great. Uh, Dr. Mechanic? Sure. Um, I, I agree completely with uh, what Dr. Singh Ospina said, but let me just extend uh, this a little bit. Uh, first of all, the current preparations of T3 tend to be short acting on a relative basis. And the data reflecting the use of that type of preparation is, is not compelling, not convincing. The few studies that are out there are highly flawed. Uh, I generally don't use it in my practice. Here are the two caveats. The first caveat is there is a role for it, and it has been used in, in the pediatric population in some children and adolescents who don't eat may have some anorexia as a, a short-term uh, trial to try to increase the appetite uh, and see if you can, as a result, increase body weight. Obviously, there are militating effects on increasing energy expenditure, so it's not a, a slam dunk. The second point, and I think this is the more important point, if the pharmaceutical industry conducted studies using long-acting T3, perhaps in a combination pill with T4, there may be a role for the following type of algorithm where if there was good uh, uh, testing for polymorphisms in T4 to T3 conversion where you could identify patients who had these inherited uh, decreases in, in conversion, some exist. Uh, but it really hasn't been studied. So theoretically, if you had that test and, and that classifier, then you might be able to uh, find an evidence base uh, on clinical trials to use these long-acting combined uh, T4, T3 preparations. That's sort of what's been out there in the literature for the future. It hasn't happened yet. So the answer to the question is that I don't use T3 right now on a regular basis. I don't think there's enough data to justify it, but there may be a future for it. Great. Uh, terrific. Um, Dr. Ospina, maybe if you could just comment and then perhaps um, Dr. Mechanic, if you could just weigh in on this. If you were to design a prospective study, what variables, uh, what important variables do you think you would include in order to try to get an answer 
to this multifactorial question? Yeah, I think uh, you know that that's a great question. Uh, again, trying to see uh, how we can move the the field forward, right? Um, so I think uh, just from taking from um, uh, obesity uh, studies, uh, things as uh, physical activity, calorie intake, with all the caveats uh, that can be brought up about how accurate they they are, um, total energy expenditure, uh, and other variables that that we know at least from the obesity literature are important. From our, our thyroid area, obviously the um, the uh, the TSH, uh, whether the patients are hypothyroid or not, are going to be important factors that have not really been adjusted for, uh, and even kind of like the the time of the of recovery um, after the surgery. Um, so I think there there will be those two groups, right, of things that we can learn from the obesity field, and then uh, specific variables related to to thyroid disease, where I would think uh, the indication. The uh, the thyroid status, uh, the indi indication for the surgery, um, the uh, and the thyroid status are probably the the most important from our from our perspective. Uh, and then, as I said, none of these studies really focus on on physical activity, uh, calorie intake, uh, or um, uh, total energy expenditure, which are you know in bariatric surgery studies and other obesity studies are are heavily uh, evaluated and measured for, because those are important confounders. And I think just the fact of doing it prospectively uh, will also uh, add to it. Um, so those are just a, a few kind of like initial thoughts I'll have about that. Great. Uh, Dr. Mechanic? Sure, um, I agree. I would just add uh, some of the following um, uh, metrics. Uh, depending on the funding level for the study, obviously. So body composition, uh, because of the differential effects on lean mass and, and uh, fat mass, and also intracellular versus extracellular water, number one. Number two, uh, a formalized dietary record uh, to actually track the foods, a food-based record of, of what patients are eating, what they might be craving, are they taking in more carbohydrate or not. Third, as was mentioned, a more formal look at lifestyle markers, and for this you can go to the American Heart Association, uh, seven uh, modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease, uh, which are obesity, hypertension, lipids, uh, uh, diabetes or dysglycemia, tobacco, healthy eating, uh, physical activity. And then uh, lastly, a more elaborate interrogation of thyroid hormone economy. Uh, to really tease apart the differential effects of uh, uh, molecular mechanisms on, on thyroid hormone metabolism. Okay. Um, and uh, thank you, Jeff. And Jeff, I think you'll, I probably know the answer to this question, but in your experience um, in the field of lifestyle medicine, how impactful has it been to try to alter behavior um, in this particular population of patients um, who perhaps have experienced weight gain um, following thyroid surgery uh, in bringing them back to um, a, a, a better um, BMI or weight uh, profile? Right. So I, I'm not as familiar with a, a study that specifically looks at this particular uh, problem other than some small studies, observational studies and anecdotes um, obviously, it makes sense, but I think the the question is: Is there a role for lifestyle medicine in patients who have diseases, particularly diseases where there's a high genetic risk, uh, and the patient, as a result of that genetic risk, uh, is pessimistic and is going to be uh, reticent to to any type of change that might be offered by the doc. And uh, the answer to that question is a New England Journal of Medicine paper, December 2016, by uh, Kara et al., K-H-E-R-A. It's a landmark paper that basically took patients who had, uh, who were classified as high genetic risk for cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease uh, based on high throughput uh, molecular studies, blood was drawn. And then correlating it with um, in in the in the uh, uh, healthcare record, the informatics, looking at the risk factors that I just went through, the cardiovascular risk factors, and what they found was that even if 
you were at high genetic risk, if you adopted a healthy lifestyle, you were able to reduce that risk by about 48%, which is huge. So I actually show patients that paper, and I, I, I discuss that paper with patients face-to-face, -face, uh, and that can be done in this particular setting preoperatively because it's a very strong motivator, and this is actually called motivational interviewing, which is part of behavioral medicine, which is part of lifestyle medicine, and these are the kind of things that should be formally integrated in a thyroid center. Terrific. Um, this is a question from Dr. Harrell. Moderate weight gain in America is when your clothes don't fit anymore. Should we really call one to three pounds of weight gain moderate weight gain? I think that's probably related to the uh, to the answer uh, of the uh, of the clinical case. Um, so probably that's uh, there's some level there of uh, there of uh, subjectivity. I think we all have patients for which uh, you know, one kilogram uh, weight gain or weight loss is uh, is significant. So um, I think in my slides I label it as a as a minor. Uh, in the in, in the question it was label, labeled as moderate. Uh, so I think that's uh, can be definitely up for discussion. But I see the point. Okay. Um, Dr. Coben has raised the question um, about postmenopausal women who were followed for three years with no thyroid issues. How many and how much weight gain um, were, was identified in that cohort? Dr. Espina? Uh, I think that uh, study was mostly highlighted uh, in the, uh, in the uh, discussion section. Uh, obviously, it was included in our group, uh, but just kind of like uh, the, the absolute, uh, kind of just an, as an absolute number, not really kind of like breaking it down. Um. Okay. Um, I, this is particularly uh, directed at um, Dr. Singh Espina. Any thoughts on why people who had surgery for benign thyroid nodules at three-year follow-up, um, uh, why this group was the one with the greatest weight change, although statistically insignificant? Right. I mean, I, I think it, it goes back to, to that question about uh, kind of like uh, a, what is uh, what would be the measurement of, of kilograms that uh, is clinically kind of like uh, relevant or and, and different. Uh, so one group was having 0.8, and then the other one 1.5, and there's a confidence interval that is associated with those uh, with those estimates. Uh, so I think uh, when you look at it, the conclusion should be that kind of like all groups were gaining a minor amount of weight, um, and the difference between those are not not necessarily statistically significant. Whether that could be clinically relevant for all patients or for a specific patient telling them that, you know, they are going to gain um, two kilos or 0.5 kilos, uh, how important that's going to be for them is kind of like more personalized and, and specific. So, um, and, and I think it just kind of like supports the fact that the group that was just being followed after FNA is a group that is kind of like gaining more weight if you just go specifically for, for by the numbers. Uh, but I think I, I favor looking at it more kind of like distant and kind of comparing across the group and saying, these are pretty close to each other and not, and then it's not a large number uh, in terms of kilograms. Terrific. All right, listen, I, um, I want to thank uh, both of our presenters for really an outstanding um, hour of, um, uh, of presentations. It's extremely interesting and on, on an extremely important topic. Um, and I want to thank you both for that. I want to thank our participants for uh, joining this discussion. And um, for those of you who have colleagues or trainees who were not able to make um, this hour and, and participate. Um, as always, we will be um, posting a recorded version of this presentation at the beginning of next week, and that will be available to all. So if you can encourage your colleagues and trainees to, um, uh, to view that, uh, they'll be able to gain the benefits of your knowledge. So thank you all and uh, everybody. Uh, we'll look forward to next week's presentation. Hope you will join us and everybody stay safe and have a great weekend. Thank you very much.